Threefold Secret of the Holy Spirit. Video 9. Conclusion. Note well here that this abiding is not a term of standing but of state. It does not precede salvation, it presumes it. A man in Christ has the spirit in virtue of his union, but many a man in Christ loses the manifestation of the spirit through failure of communion. Many a Christian is right in standing, but wrong in state, sure of salvation, but slack in walk and communion. In such, barrenness of life and powerlessness in service indicate not lost salvation in Christ, but lost fellowship with Christ, not lost justification, but lost manifestation, not loss of saving faith, but loss of abiding faith in the sense already used. The simple thought then of this faith of abiding is that of a constant looking to Jesus for our spiritual life. These three words, looking to Jesus, picture perfectly the posture of the soul that is abiding in Christ. The moon keeps looking to the sun for every gleam of her reflected radiance. The branch keeps looking to the vine for every whit of its life and fruitage. The drinking fountain keeps looking to the supplying reservoir for every drop of water it is to pour out to its thirsting visitors. The arc light keeps looking to the great dynamo for every ray of the stream of light with which it floods the midnight darkness. Even so, the child of God, who would master the final secret of the Holy Ghost, the secret of his constant manifestation, must keep looking to Jesus moment by moment until such abiding in faith becomes the constant attitude of his soul. It may be, Yea, it will be difficult, at first, to incarnate this principle of looking to Christ alone in every detail of our lives means much to us all. To silence the clamour of fleshly voices, to lean not upon the fleshly understanding, to quell the energy of fleshly haste, to distrust all plans not born in or from prayer to lay the hand of strong restraint upon every impulse until it has been proved by prayerful waiting to be of God. To not only say no confidence in the flesh, but to live no confidence is an attitude not attained with ease and at a single bound. But it shall be ours. Jesus has commanded it. John 15, 4, and all his commands are enabling. And as out of our very failures to abide, the deep need of abiding becomes more manifest, we shall, even as we look to him for the power to abide, come at length to it, and then, really accepting and practising our own helplessness, to look to Jesus for strength and find it, to look to him for guidance and see with our own eyes the wondrous ways in which he leads, to look to him for anointing and to be as conscious of the Spirit's gracious presence as we are of our own identity, to look to him for fruit-bearing and be astonished at the fruitage he can bear such branches as we are. How precious is all this fruitage of abiding life. Beloved, are we so dissatisfied with self as to feel the supreme need of Christ alone? Do we realise that in ourselves we are dead men and women? The very fact that a man must be born again, do we realise this to be in itself the most tremendous indictment against and proof of the utter worthlessness of our own natural self-life that a holy God could ever array against us? Have we accepted the logical consequences of regeneration, 
in their bearing on holy living? Do we realise our need of living in God as well as being born of God? Are we conscious of our need of abiding? Are we following after abiding? Surely its reward is rich, for he himself hath said, Abide in me, and I in you. Abiding in love We have seen the truth of abiding, on the faith side of it. We have seen how the believer must keep on looking to Christ day by day for his spiritual life, must keep in constant hourly touch with him, must by a life of prayer, communion and trust keep momentarily drawing upon him in whom dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But, as we have seen, he that keepeth his commandments, he it is that abideth in him. Abiding is the keeping of his commandments. There is more than one. There is not only believing in the name of his Son Jesus Christ, but love one another. Not only faith, but love. Hence abiding is not only communion, but ministry. Not only inflow, but outflow. Not only an attitude toward God, but also toward men. Not only looking to Jesus, but loving others. He, therefore, who would live the abiding life in all its fullness and symmetry, and know the manifestation of Christ which attaches to it, needs not only to be constantly drawing by faith upon the fullness of Jesus for his daily walk and life, but needs also to be constantly loving others instead of loving self. That the abiding manifestation of the Spirit of God can be only to those who not only live the life of faith, but the life of constant love is founded on the very nature of God, for 1. God, who is love, love of others, can manifest himself only to those who are also willing to love others. God is love. We see him as love in the declaration of his word. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Having loved his own, he loved them unto the end. As the Father hath loved me, even so have I loved you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. We see it in God the Father, planning from the eternal ages for the salvation of men. We see it in God the Son as he poured out his life in unwearying ministry for the souls and bodies of men, as his heart agonised in compassion for the multitudes like sheep without a shepherd, as he endured with majestic patience the taunts and jibes of the judgment scene, as he bowed in agony under the bloody blows of the scourge, as, at the last, in his own body, bearing our sins on the tree, his dying breath was spent in plaintive prayer for his murderers. We see, too, God the Spirit to be love. How tender in pleading with men, how gentle in rebuke, how tireless and patient under resistance, how loath to leave, Though flouted and scorned, how quick to forgive the crimson sins and remorseful follies of the vanished years of a wasted life. Yea, the Father, who gave his only begotten to send salvation, the Son, who bled upon the felon's cross to bring salvation, and the Spirit, who for thousands of years has yearned over and wrought with men to apply salvation. These three are one God of eternal, 
self-sacrificing, changeless, quenchless love, love for others. Hence, the very nature of God, which is love, love of others, requires for its manifestation a life which is willing to love as he loves. Love not self, but others. The only way to secure the manifestation of the electric current is to supply the steel or copper wire or other conductor which its nature demands. Even so, the only way to secure an abiding manifestation of God in us is to supply the conductor which he in his nature demands, in a life which is yielded forever to love others, even as he loves. The life of a child of God, so yielded to live out the great command, love one another, is as much a conductor for the manifestation of the God of love as the metal wire is for the manifestation of electric force. For this is the law of the Spirit's activity, it is the only line along which he will operate. Who would expect that spirit to manifest himself through a murderous or a sensual life? Neither can he manifest himself through a life whose ruling principle is love of self, for he is utterly unselfish. Therefore, when Jesus Christ states clearly that the manifestation of God is to him who keepeth his commandments, and then, then says, This is my commandment, that ye love one another, even as I have loved you. He makes the manifestation of God in this spirit a logical necessity to him who is willing to shift the centre of his life from love of self to love of others, and a logical impossibility to him who is not willing so to do. 2. Hence, that child of God will have the fullest manifestation of God in the Spirit, who adopts as the deliberate purpose and principle of his life the love of others, instead of the love of self. This is the law through which the Spirit acts, and if he would have the manifestation of that Spirit, he must deliberately accept this law as the law of his new life. True, this law of love is the exact opposite of the law that all his lifetime has been controlling him. But that is the very point. He needs a different law, a different law of action, a new commandment I give unto you, because he is now yielding himself to a different life, a new life, the life of the Spirit. And so when Christ gives us a new nature, he gives us a new commandment. When he gives us a new life, he gives us a new law of manifestation adapted to that life. And since the new nature is the deadly foe of the exact opposite of the old, we would expect that the law of its manifestation would be the exact opposite of the law of the old. Hence, the believer who desires the manifestation of the Spirit must expect for the government and regulation of his new life a new principle, totally different from that which has shaped almost every act of his past life, the principle of loving others instead of loving self. And what a far-reaching, heart-searching, breathtaking change this is, to cease to grasp all and begin to give all, to cease to seek all and begin to surrender all, to cease accenting, take care of number one, and begin to assent, let every man care for the things of others, to no longer seek the high place but the lowly one, to aim now to minister instead of to be ministered unto, to no longer seek, but to shun the praise of men, to no longer save the life, but lose it for others, to no longer lay up, 
enjoy and be at ease, but to suffer and spend and be spent for Christ himself. All this is a complete reversal of the deep-rooted, all-controlling principle of the natural human heart, the principle of self-love. To the world, the mere suggestion of such a thing is astounding, that a man should deliberately renounce all self-seeking, self-praise, renounce his gaining, grasping, dreaming, striving, toiling and scheming for self, and as deliberately give himself to seek, strive, toil, suffer, sacrifice, plan, plead, pray, and live for others. This is something the natural man will not receive. It is monstrous, impracticable, incredible, suicidal. But, beloved, this is exactly what Jesus Christ did and exactly what you and I must do to know the manifestation of his life within us. As surely as love of self is the first law of nature, is love of others the first law of of God. Astonishing, sweeping and destructive of every self-interest as the law of love is, yet he who yields will know God as he never otherwise can know him. He will be most filled with the new life who yields most fully to the new commandment. This new commandment is the supreme expression of God's will for our earthly walk. Whoso yields to it reverses the motive principle of his being, but he also reverses the whole current of manifestation. He who once knew the self-life in its fullness comes to know as never before the fullness of the Christ life. 3. He who would know the abiding manifestation of God needs to abide in love. We need not only to accept this great commandment as the rule of our life, but need to carry it into our daily life in actual practice. The act of surrender to do God's will of love is not enough unless it is followed by a daily, hourly doing of that greatest command and the manifestation of his presence and love which accompanies surrender will fail of continuousness if we do not daily live that which we yield ourselves to live, the love life of God. Hence, the need of abiding in love. For he that abideth in love abideth in God, and God abideth in him. 1 John 4.16 To abide in love is to incarnate the great law of love of others, into every detail of our daily life. Not only must the self-life be renounced by a solemn, definite act, but the habit of selfishness must be replaced by the habit of love. We are to practice the new commandment in everything, following after love, as Paul says, until it becomes the steadfast law of our being in all its details. We are to make love one another the touchstone by which to test every thought, word and deed of our daily lives until all are brought into conformity to the law which was supreme in the life of Jesus Christ himself. The rebuke you administered yesterday to a brother in Christ, was it done in love or vexation? The counsel you gave Was it proffered in love or pride of opinion? The meeting you led, the address you made, were they in love to help others or to add to your own reputation? The money you gave, was it in love to the lost or in pride and self-esteem? The remarks you make about others, are they in love? The thoughts you cherish in your secret heart concerning them, are they, too, full of love? Your giving, spending, ministering, your praying, 
and purposing are they all in love. This is the supreme test of every detail of your life, by which you may know whether it is God that worketh in you, or self. And how quickly that abiding in love becomes a condition of the manifestation of the Spirit. Let a day be spent in this attitude of love to others instead of love of self. Let the words be kind and gentle, the acts helpful, unselfish and considerate, the hours filled with loving, unselfish ministry, and the heart the abode of sympathetic, kindly thought. That day is a day of blessing, and the consciousness of the Spirit's blessed presence in the heart. But let the words be harsh, the thoughts envious or spiteful, the acts selfish, the hours filled with self-seeking instead of self-forgetfulness, and who does not know the conscious shadowing of God's presence, the conscious grieving of the Spirit in such days and hours? In the grain elevators of the West are different compartments for the various grains. <coughs> Open. Open one spout, and the golden corn manifests itself in a rich outflowing stream. Open another leading to a different chamber, and the amber wheat pours forth like an unceasing stream. Open others, and the oats or barley or rye will severally flow forth according as the respective channels to each are tapped. Now within us dwell the spirit and the flesh, the God nature which is love, and the old nature which is selfish. The moment we do an act, speak a word, think a thought in love. God, who is love, manifests himself. But the moment we speak in harshness, act in selfishness, and think in envy, hatred or spite, the flesh manifests itself. The law is as certain, simple and inexorable as the law by which the kind of grain manifested depends upon the specific channel which is thrown open. If we yield to love, will to love, incarnate love, abide in love, we shall surely be blessed with the conscious manifestation of the God who is love. For we have opened the channel through which the spirit of love is bound to flow forth. But if our words are bitter, our thoughts and our aims constantly centred in self, our actions purely selfish, our lives self-centred and loveless, then the manifestation of the flesh, the self-life, the old nature, is just as certain and inevitable as the manifestation of the Spirit to him who walks in love. Christ cannot manifest himself through a life of murder or theft, that is self-evident. But it is equally evident to us that Christ cannot manifest himself through any act that is selfish or unchristlike. Every root of bitterness, every yielding to selfishness, every harsh judgment in our daily walk must and does of necessity break Christ's communion with us. How zealous and careful should we be then to abide in love, that every act be done in love to others. Shun a selfish act as you would a sensual one. Shrink from an unloving thought or suggestion as you would from the hiss of a serpent. Eschew hasty bitter words as you would poisoned darts or daggers. Realise what so astounds the natural heart that God loves, regardless of his treatment by others. He is kind to the unthankful and the evil. Even so should we. So, if some grievous wrong, insult or unkindness goads you from your attitude of love, justify it not, but hasten to confess 
and find forgiveness from him who prayed for those who murdered him, as well as for those who loved him. Note well here that the supreme expression of love is ministry, even unto sacrifice and death. Love is not mere sentiment, mere emotional outflow. True, it must first be in the heart, whose attitude is to be steadily one of love for others. But thence it flows forth in ministry, in service, in sacrifice for others. Little children, let us love in deed and in truth, says John. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. God so loved that he gave, he served, he died for the lost. This is the test of love. The inevitable outcome of the love life within is ministry and service without. True love must minister. The love of Christ con constrains it so to do. Yet be it remembered that they who lie upon beds of suffering and helplessness may in the secret outgoings of their hearts and in the ministry of prayer for others live the love life as truly as those who minister by hand, tongue or pen. For as in giving, so it is here, that if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and that not according to that he hath not. 4. Faith is the gateway of communion with God. Love is the gateway of ministry to men. He who keeps them both constantly open has learned to abide in Christ. The believer is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That temple is double-gated. Faith is the gateway open Godward. Love is the gateway open manward. Through faith, the divine life, so to speak, flows into us. Through love it flows out to others. Faith is the channel of communion with God. Love, the channel of ministry to men. God desires not only to pour out his life into us through faith, but through us to others, through love. The Spirit not only wants us to let him in, but also to let him out to others. It is not enough for us simply to receive the Holy Spirit. It is not enough to have him indwelling in us. It is not enough to have his love, peace and power in ourselves and for ourselves only. There is someone else in the universe besides God, the giver of the Holy Spirit and us, the recipients. There is an unsaved, dying, perishing world whom he loves even as he loved us. Unless they see Christ through us, they will never see him. Unless they hear of him through us, they will die in darkness. Unless he touches them through us, they will never know the touch of his life and power. When he walked the earth, he was constantly pouring out his own love life in sacrifice, ministry and blessing to all about him. Now he is no longer in the world, but we are in the world as members of his body, branches of him, the living vine, and he longs to continue pouring forth that life through us. Faith is thus the channel of divine inflow, love the channel of divine outflow. Through faith, God has all chance to work in us, through love all opportunity to work through us. Faith which worketh through love, is the way Paul puts it. Faith looking hourly to Jesus, constantly receiving his inpouring life, as constantly pours it out through love, the door kept open toward the perishing. He abides in Christ, who keeps both these doors constantly open. Neither dares he to, to be shut. To close the door of faith is to have the inner man grow weak for lack of communion. 
to close the door of love is to have him grow weak for lack of ministry. Thus the believer is a channel for the spirit who is, in figure, a stream. Out of him shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit which they should receive. John 7.38 That which has been received is to flow out. A good channel is always receiving, always full and always outflowing. To be a good channel, one needs to keep constantly open at the point of inflow and the point of outflow. Therefore, these two gateways of faith and love must be kept constantly open. Through faith, the gateway open Godward, as it were. We constantly receive the divine life in communion. Through love, the gateway opens manward. We constantly give out the divine life in ministry and service. The channel which shuts one gate ceases to be a channel, for inflow without outflow means stagnation, and outflow without inflow means emptiness. We dare not cease from faith, we dare not relax in love. We must pass from the inflow of communion to the outflow of service and back again, from the outgiving of service to the replenishment of communion. He who shuts either the gate of communion or the gate of ministry writes over his life, no thoroughfare. But he has no sooner done this than the spirit with invisible hand writes over that same life, no abiding. Not realising that both are needed to form a rounded, symmetrical, complete life in Christ, men have tried to divorce them, essayed to live one without the other. Realising that apart from Christ they could do nothing, seeing the need of close, constant communion with him, conscious of the blessing and power of the life of prayer, they have given themselves wholly to the faith side of the abiding life. They have retired from the world with its sin and follies. They have hidden themselves in the seclusion of cell and cloister. They have given themselves to prayer, meditation and communion. But when God revealed himself to them through the life of communion, instead of opening the door of love, applying themselves to ministry and giving out spiritual blessing and life to those in need, they essayed to keep to themselves the life which is given for all men. Thence came the morbid, unnatural, unhealthful type of life that dwelt in a monastery and the hermit's cell and degenerated when unaccompanied by the everyday ministry of love into spiritual death and barrenness. Christ himself could not live such a life, but when... Anointed by the Holy Ghost, he went about doing good. The faith side of the abiding life is absolutely essential. We must realise our own spiritual deadness. We must look to Jesus constantly. We must, hour by hour, draw upon his divine life. But faith without works is dead. Inflow without outflow is stagnation. Communion without ministry is one-sidedness. Others there are who give themselves wholly to Christian service and activities. Their life is one continual round of meetings, societies, conventions, addresses and services without number. To them, hours of prayer are an unknown factor. Communion is a meaning, meaningless term. Waiting on God, a waste of precious time. The guidance of the spirit and the life of trust are sound without significance. Yet these lives, with all their busyness, lack a radical something. There is fret and fume, worry and anxiety, conscious lack of quickening power in service, absence of joy, peace and blessing in the lives they are living with such intensity. It is but the same shield viewed from the obverse side. Works wrought 
in our own might, our dead works. The chamber of prayer is the only true powerhouse. Ministry without anointing is lifeless. We must touch Christ before we touch men. We cannot pour out if we have not received from him. One touch of a live wire will thrill a man through and through, but you may touch him all day with a dead one and never quicken him. Faith without ministry is dead. Ministry without faith, which is ministry apart from Christ, is declared by Christ himself to be nothing. He then who continuously lives out these two great commandments of Christ, he who constantly keeps open these two doors of faith and love, he who thus becomes the thoroughfare of the Holy Spirit, has learned the final secret of the Spirit, the secret of the abiding life. Wherefore, to abide in Christ is to live a life of constant faith Christward and constant love manward. Beloved, have we learned this final secret of the Holy Ghost? Are we living the abiding life? Do we realise, on the one hand, our helpless hourly dependence upon Jesus Christ as the only fullness of life for us? Are we learning the lesson of looking to him in all things? Has it become the habitual attitude of our lives? Are we slow to speak, to plan, to act, until we have been in touch and counsel with him? Are we not only pouring out our lives for him, but, what is still more important, are we holding ourselves in such an attitude that he can pour out his life through us? In short, are we remaining, staying, living, abiding in faith? Furthermore, do we realise that he is love, love of others, that he wants us to be like him and therefore says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, even as I have loved you. Have we given up our self-love then, and made it the supreme purpose of our lives to love others? And if so, are we living it? Are we asking ourselves day by day and hour by hour, Did I do this in love of others? Did I plan this in love? Did I speak this in love? Did I give or minister or serve in love, love of others? Do we throttle every harsh word, resent every selfish thought, refuse every selfish act, because each violates the great love law of our new life? Do we understand that this love means practical, constant, lifelong ministry and service for others, even as he served when on earth? Are we keeping both commandments continuously? Are both gates open? Are our quiet hours given to communion and our busy ones to ministering in love? However humble and commonplace the things we do may seem, are we so constantly looking to him and so busy in loving others that we are beginning to understand just a little that wonderful sentence, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. Have we thus tasted of abiding? Are we following after abiding? If so, let us rejoice, for it is not only ours in promise and ours in command, but it is to be ours in actual, conscious experience, as his own blessed word declares. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. The End